you know, I got the, the Henry Chiffon, Martha Cooper at Subway Art Book. People have got nicknames. The name is a part of the lore. I just started signing things as Echo. That's who I was. In 1987, a 15-year-old high schooler with an airbrush in Lakewood, New Jersey, had an idea. Mark Echo combined his love for graffiti culture with a talent for illustration and laid the foundation for a multifaceted, decade-spanning creative empire. Despite many patches of turbulence when it all could have come crashing down, and a couple times it even did, over the course of his 30-year career, Echo built a half-billion-dollar clothing line, a million-unit selling video game, and a generation-defining media company, all while pursuing a quiet but consistent commitment to philanthropy that he's turned into his third act. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your career ambitions? My mother uh, studied to be a nurse, and then she didn't practice for that long because she started having the, the family. And then my dad practiced pharmacy. He graduated from Rutgers College of Pharmacy, where I ended up going to school. I remembered vividly my parents being very entrepreneurial. Like even, even my mom being the, the sort of homemaker, she always had an entrepreneurial flourish. And then my dad uh, watched my mom go out and get her real estate license in the 80s. And I guess he got some FOMO or, or that created validation for him to try his hand at it. Being in a house where both the parents were, had a side hustle and like that was very much a part of um, the conversation in the house, the relationship with their work, uh, our reverence for that, the impact it had on our extracurriculars. I definitely think that that had a profound impact. How did growing up in Lakewood, New Jersey frame your sort of uh, understanding of culture? I was very lucky to grow up there. There was this sort of tale of two cities thing that happened in Lakewood. Everything uh, west of Route 9 was uh, largely uh, middle class, the east lower part, poor. But then there was also this big contingency of like Lubavitch or Jewish folks surrounded by suburbia, right? And hip hop culture was really emergent. And I felt it in my town of Lakewood because it was so diverse. And as seventh grader, sixth grader, fifth grader, whatever, you're just kids, you know, you're just starting to create your identity. I stood out because of my affinity for art and illustration. So I very much attached to that. I would say my biggest, earliest supporter were my parents. They made a fuss of my love of art and illustration, they hung stuff on the wall did that uh, validating that is so important to adolescents. You are getting interested in illustration and graffiti and airbrushing mm -hmm. and emulating guys like Shirt Kings and Fade mm -hmm. and these guys. How are you even getting exposed to the work that they're doing? I think it's a universal story. You're adolescent, you're trying to fit in to your tribe, you're finding the boundaries of your tribe, you're defining who they are, and you are sharing your interests. Being at a, a friend's house and there's like Black Beat Magazine, and you're scrolling through the pages and you see LL wearing an airbrush thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And you go to the mall and you and end up at the, the bookstore with my dad and like that Henry Chaffant and Martha Cooper book, and finding that, that book and being like, <gasps> You know, this music played, you know, all the color spilled out in my face. And then you connect it. You go visit family in Queens, or I go to Trenton. Then you see the elevated trains, and you'd see it, and you're like, oh, it starts, you start to realize your place in this space. 
Speaking of finding your identity, around the same time is when you arrive upon your name. And uh, yeah. there's nothing, I think, more central or core to a person's identity than their name. How did you land upon Echo and, and what did that mean to you in that moment? It was actually given to me as a nickname by my mother. I have a twin sister, Marcy, M-A-R-C-I, I'm M-A-R-C. She's five minutes older than me. My mother did not know she was carrying twins until she bared us. Back in 72, when I was born, they didn't have uh, all the same tests or whatever, and they missed that one. But you look back at the photos, and you're like, how could you have missed it? My mother was like, huge, you know? So how, who missed that? My mother would go to the doctor and say, why do I feel kicking in my breast and in the lower portion of my belly? How is the baby able to do that? Oh, it's just an echo in the fluids. It's just an echo in the fluids, don't worry. And then the echo in the fluids was me. And so that was like a nickname. And then um, it, it served as useful. You know, I got the, the Henry Chiffon, Martha Cooper at Subway Art Book. People have got nicknames. It's like the name is a part of the lore. It's like the foundation story, right? For the, you know, the superhero. So uh, I started using it. I just started signing things as Echo. Like, I didn't realize how meaningful it was gonna be until I kind of started the business. I marketed it as Echo Airbrushing, you know, and I would, that's who I was. How old were you when you launched the airbrushing business? I started formally airbrushing in eighth grade. I got my air compressor and airbrush. And also another kind of crazy thing about Lakewood, the ultimate and singular magazine of the industry is Airbrush Action Magazine, published in Lakewood, New Jersey. <laughs> so what are the odds of that? Come the end of freshman year, I was selling t-shirts for fundraisers, like for the school, like in wow. the school. I would say by the time I was a senior, like going into that summer, the word of mouth had grown so much. I had such a sort of avid clientele. I probably was, I don't know, making, you know, at least a couple grand, like on a good week, wow. you know? So some droughts, cause I was going to, when I went to Rutgers and I started school, I would just be like, I can't work right now. I can't take, I can't say yes to, to any work. But it was always like this, like, you know, oh man, there's that calling and like the business was there. So this is like high school. First business card, probably ninth grade stuff, you know, this is very, like very super. Fade influence, yeah, Shirt yeah, Kings. This, yeah, very Shirt Kings. This is, was when it was all happening. You know, this was like 88. You know, we were all a part of this sort of energy, right? And you're in your little domain and you're just making stuff. I look back at this and I think it was the most important part of my career, like in terms of informing the path that I was gonna carve out for myself and pretty much has been my life's path. You're making thousands of dollars, thousands in, of dollars. In, in the late 80s as a high school senior, but you still end up going to pharmaceutical school. Yes. What was holding you back from just jumping in? There's a lot of things different today. I think what's maybe universally not different is that sort of sense, however real or imagined, of following in a parent's footstep or doing kind of quote the right thing from an academic point of view. So my dad, who ironically, it was right in front of me, wasn't even practicing pharmacy by the time I graduated high school, but he went to Rutgers College of Pharmacy. So I just thought like, oh, this is kind of check a box. Like I'll, I'll make my parents proud. You go and then you continue to work on the airbrushing on the yeah, side. Yeah. And I know you, you know, you have a moment with Red Alert that's very affirming yeah. to yeah. you. And I think like a, a real point of inflection. Oh in yeah. Your, sort of ambition. I go to Rutgers, my identity, it starts to kind of cure like glue or paint drying, you know, like, okay, you're different than these other kids. That was a 
interesting period because I found myself sort of like not fitting in. I couldn't find a tribe. I had my little friend of misfit nerds and we, and it was a reflection of us. Like we were all a very mixed group. We were kind of the, the kids that were like, well, we're into all these things. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, you could be into the cure and into the tribe called quest, right? Like it's okay, right? It's not that deep, right? So long story short, Thursday, you know, Friday nights, what do you do? What's the ritual? You put on the radio, get the, the cassette ready. That'd be the kid in the room drawing by himself, listening to Red Alert. And Red Alert would be shouting people out. And I just was curious, like, how do I get a shout out? It was really that simple. It was really that simple. It was like, I want a shout out. I would bomb Red Alert with faxes. I'd go to the, to, you know, the Kinko's and I would just draw stuff. I'd look at, the liner notes of the records to find like where the street address was mm -hmm. for packages. I would just mail shit. And I would just like, just, you know, hit them with stuff until, you know, one day I'm sitting there on a Friday night and I'm taping. It's like, yo, shout out to my man, Echo. I just got this like ill flyer or whatever. And he's got this event going on. And thanks for the, you know, the custom airbrush. And the next day, all my friends heard it. What was the battery that that put in your bag? And how did that change? Oh my gosh, it was behavior. like such a, it went from like role playing, right? Like you're, you're faking it till you make it. Like, and then suddenly there was this sort of moment of validation. It was like, oh shit. Who else on this campus is getting shouted out by Red Alert? That's, I started getting like that kind of level of confidence. I would say my role model is a composite of all the people that have helped me overcome my fear in whatever little ways or big ways that they have. I think role modeling, putting that on one singular person, it's like an energy, it's like a force, right? So I extract it from a lot of folks that have been in my life. I know that as the idea of Echo as a clothing company starts to come into focus. You pitch both Michael Bivens and Spike Lee yeah. on this. And for whatever reason, it doesn't seem to work out. And then you end up finding a, a partner in a yeah. very unlikely place yes. in an Orthodox Jewish gentleman named yeah. Seth Gersberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess tell me a little bit about that. A, the process of pitching yeah. and being rejected. And then how you found Seth. First of all, the pitches, it wasn't like Spike was in the room on that pitch. And what's interesting is when you go in cold, even to Michael Bivens, you know, um, and I remember his aunt ran his Philly office and I had a good rapport with her and my good friend who's also from Lakewood named Kali Brock, um, who was a singer. And when I did the swag bomb for Michael, for Biv, we put a cassette of Kali into that jacket, yeah. right? That was another moment of sort of affirmation. And you start to get this sort of level of uh, swagger, uh, confidence, delusion, okay? Where I show up in Philadelphia to Biv's office. He doesn't know I'm about to pitch him. He just thinks I'm there with Kali and I just bum rush him with a pitch. So it, I look back at that and I, 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 talk, I talk about it in my book as if it was like this, oh, I pitched and I got ready. I didn't even know that they knew I was pitching. But in my mind, okay. in my mind, it was real. Okay, and in my mind, it was a no. So I'm shooting blanks, right? Swing and miss, swing and miss, swing and miss. One of my good high school friends who was a year younger than me is a guy named Perry Landisberg. He says, oh, I got this guy, man. He's kind of crazy. I don't know, man. He's just like you, he's entrepreneurial. and." He's at school, I think he's about to leave school just like you are, and his name is Seth and you should meet him. But here it was the beginning of my career and it was kind of, felt like, well, college, the, the implication, leaving college, ooh. These are big, like what he was willing to do. And he knew investors that had, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I remember him coming to me with like a bag of cash, like the first bag of cash to fund, uh, or second t-shirt. Right? The first t-shirt I'd printed on my own, at a local screen printer it had like the the red tag of ECHO Unlimited and the character on the back with his foot up and that's what I was like pushing as like my logo and but I wanted to print the multicolor thing I couldn't afford to do it 
um, from all my artwork. And Seth was like, I'm, uh, uh, I'll be your partner. I had questions he had an answer. And when he didn't have an answer, he had the sort of brash belief in himself and in me. So it's like, we'll figure it out. Let's just do it. These were like early t-shirts. This was the one. Yeah, this was called Powerful Potion, this one. I didn't really understand like the physics of like fabric and like, you know how your shoulder is like this fabric is falling right here. So what I would do to compensate, I would just draw faces in where the folds were and it became like a thing, but it was actually, you know, my, my weakness was my differentiator. You start with these t-shirts that are essentially mining your sketchbooks yeah. with graphics. I'm curious, cause this is like 91, 92. What were the brands that you were looking at as a blueprint? Carl Kanai was coming up. Cross Colors was popping. You know, I would read the Source magazine. You know, I remember reading about Russell is gonna launch a clothing company and there was an emergent thing happening. At what point do you start contemplating what the brand of Echo Unlimited means and, and what that sort of relationship with the consumer is about? I think I, I understood the convergence thing early on. I couldn't articulate it. And I was very intimidated. I was often ridiculed by my peers for the point of view that I had on the brand because there was a certain orthodoxy happening within emerging streetwear, right? I remember being at a trade show and all of my near peers and not so near peers that were bigger commercial brands started encroaching a little bit on the aesthetic of what I was doing and what some of my near peers were doing. I'm walking that trade show and I'm looking at all the brands that I admire. There's a Ralph Lauren booth there and there's a giant polo horse, there's a Lacoste alligator, there's the Timberland tree. And I realize I, I go back into our little section, our little area of this trade show floor and everybody's kind of shooting from the same angle, right? Uh, um, where everyone's just doing word marks. I'm like, that seems like a missed opportunity. Like, what would my logo be? You know, I need a logo, I need a mascot. Well, if Ralph could do it, I could do it. I didn't want to just be like a streetwear brand. It never like occurred to me like that was the ceiling. It was always like, I want to be like Timberland big. I want to be like Tommy Hilfiger big or Polo big. In the coming years, Echo Unlimited would achieve its founders' wildest ambitions of competing with brands like Hilfiger and Polo, ultimately setting the stage for Mark to leverage this success into forays in gaming and publishing. But misaligned visions and organizational overreach would collide with the Great Recession and imperil everything he had spent the last two decades building. We've talked a lot about the importance of identity and a of brand fairly early on, but after you've really done a lot of the legwork to establish the brand, mm -hmm. you get hit with a cease and desist around the name Echo. Yeah. And you're forced to change it. How do you feel about what that forced you and the brand to do? Funny enough, in retrospect, like the things that are your struggles can be your strengths. And in this case, that struggle, which at the time felt like persecution or something that was unjustly put on me, was actually an exercise in good hygiene, an exercise in better differentiating the brand. It allowed me to um, bolster the strength of the E-C-K-O mark. Okay. Because the unique spelling made getting the URLs easier. There is a level of art and craft in doing business, how people actually orchestrate the complexities of a business to do things and create new models and expand in ways that you, you didn't contemplate. I think the most important idea I've ever had wasn't exactly an idea, but it was a philosophy of learning to love the problem and not love the idea. The hard goods business can be incredibly brutal in so much as you get these orders mm -hmm. and then you have to put up capital in order to create the goods and then fulfill them. And I know that in that period, Echo went through 
a lot of really challenging financial moments, you yeah. get $2 million worth of orders, which yeah. is a moment you talk about in your book, literally crying on the phone with your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you very, very quickly realized that the difference between getting $2 million worth of orders and then fulfilling $2 million worth of orders and maintaining even a hair of margin are completely different things. Tell me a little bit about what was that realization like and then how did that inform how you guys move forward? In that moment of like hanging up the phone, I can't believe we got $2 million in paper. That was so real. And it's, I, I tell young people today, like people that are, let's say, fundraising or they're starting a business and they, they think like, okay, they closed that round of funding. They think they, like, they've achieved. It's like, man, you haven't even started. It's getting into relationship with the problems. Like the idea of Echo Unlimited, the idea of the Rhino, that was sort of an intention setter. But then there's the problem of having to actually make it real. And you have to love the problem as much as you love the idea. I know that you guys had to do some fairly extraordinary and somewhat ethically dubious things in order to, you know, make payments be delayed or, yes. you know, borrow credit cards from employees and stuff like that. Oh, it was brutal. Yeah, I mean, it makes for a funny anecdote, you know, in a, in a sort of midlife crisis book about, you know, putting your spit on your thumb and rubbing over the barcode of the check, which conveniently obscures the numbers so that when the check gets run and processed at the, at the bank, it's going gonna, it's gonna to slow the, 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 the payments down by a few days because it had to be manually done. Now, today, I don't think that's the case anymore with direct-to-digital uh, depositing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we would do things like that, and we were upside down. This was a, a voyage of tremendous um, self sacrifice, uh, mental health, uh, physical well-being, financial uh, sacrifice, relational sacrifice, ethical sacrifice. A lot of things you do that, like, you look back on now, I look back on with age, and I'm like, I don't know that I would operate that way. How did you manage that emotionally as someone who I know is sensitive and yeah. who is an artist and, yeah. and cares deeply both about the brand and also about the team that you're managing. You asked a question before about when did you get to know that you had a brand? Is like when you start to be able to lend the IP, you start to take a loan against your own IP. I remember oftentimes and boldly like taking massive lines of credit to fund. So what were the assets that I had? I had inventory that maybe had a long shelf life, like basic core items, like a pledge of that. So if, it, if I went upside down, the bank takes that. Uh, I could pledge the IP, the trademarks, and then they were getting high every season, more and more high valued, right? But it was crazy because we were more and more overextending ourselves, right? To go from that sort of role playing, make believe to the real, that space takes a tremendous amount of um, cash. And I was just naive and stupid. Like in retrospect, I should have been more patient. You know, having the sales volume the explosive sort of perception that the brand is in a great state, but then the reality that you're upside down. I've learned that you tend to make your same mistakes twice. <laughs> I learned that mistakes are a stubborn thing and that learning is a stubborn process and you gotta have a growth mindset and give yourself grace because you're probably gonna do the first or second cousin of that mistake. But as long as you're learning, you're good. As Echo starts to reach some ubiquity in the marketplace yeah. um, in around the turn of the century, yeah. you become very interested in two pursuits outside of just apparel, video games yeah. and publishing. I'd say like in 1999 to 2000, I start to more conscientiously be ready to market myself. We renamed the company Mark Echo Enterprises. And so the gaming became a part of that. And right? you guys so, had the, the all Echo team, right? We had like an all Echo team in Madden. I forget even the year it was, but it was f awesome. It had man. like Be Real and Noriega and- uh, All of Dela. Yep. Rest in peace, Dave. And I remember I was with Fat Joe 
And I remember him saying to me, yo, Echo, you went platinum with the Madden shit. You know that, right? You know, I was just young and ambitious and you don't say, well, I'm pioneering, but like you, you're, you're effectively a part of a, a cohort that is in fact doing things for the first time. And that was a very special place to be. And, and I'm proud of, I'm proud that the Echo brand did a lot of firsts. From there, you then go to making your own game. Yes. And getting up, where you play a graffiti writer. Yeah. And you gamified the competitive sport of graffiti. Two, nearly a million yeah. unit sales, which yeah. is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it was crazy. You know, what was that process like? And what was it like ultimately to have this game in stores with your name? I didn't want to be boxed in. And I felt like if Ralph was building a lifestyle brand and world building, if he could do furniture, I could do video games. That was like my logic. If Ralph could do tufted leather couches, I could do video games. And I was the beneficiary of being there early. That was a luck. And you talked about wanting to do things that Ralph had not been able to do. And one of those is to create a magazine right. successfully. It came out of, okay, the role playing. It was just RPG. I want to build a fashion house. So when I would show up at Details Magazine or GQ and they'd bring the, the publisher, they rarely brought the editor, right? They rarely mm -hmm. brought And when they did, the editor was kind of like, okay, I'm here for like the, the meeting for like the ads, like hopefully I get the ads. And I'm be like, well, are you gonna place my product in the editorial? And, it was always kind of a struggle, right? And it wasn't alone, it wasn't unique to me. Uh, my peers, you know, Fat Farm, Triple Five, um, eventually Sean John, Rock Aware, all these guys, like with the kind of, like the, the traditional fashion media kind of rolled their eyes at us. They thought we were corny. They thought it was just a, a trend. They thought it was actually ugly. Urban apparel was like code for, that's like stuff that like black people or poor people wear, right? Or like white trash or something, you know? So there was this sort of classism thing that I was encountered with when I would go place my media buying that informed my sort of revenge fantasy to say, well, f them, I'm gonna create my own magazine. We're gonna build the template, how this cohort this sort of car this band of misfits sees themselves because we see ourselves as beautiful and we see ourselves as creative and we see ourselves as luxurious. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? I think you try to hold on to your sense of authorship, sense of being fruitful. I think it's really, really important that you feel like you're being generative. So you launched the magazine with its original team. Yes. And fairly shortly thereafter, you end up pivoting and adding Rich Antonello yep. and then myself. Both of us came into it with a bit of a pedigree, but Rich was coming from the Nat Geo adventure right. world, and I was coming from the hip hop world, but I was a child at the time, mm -hmm. 25. What gave you guys the confidence to put this part of your business in the hands of us? We were moving all the business into New York. Right, that was an exciting sort of re-energizing moment for Complex. You know, Rich came from Nat Geo, but he was a, a New York kid from Brooklyn that like grew Absolutely. up with hip hop. You know, I wanted, I was making a video game. You guys were building Complex. Um, it was super exciting. You and also, at that point, are really diversifying the portfolio. Oh yeah. Echo Red, you have G Unit, you have Averex, yeah. Zoo York. Yeah. I'm curious for you, you know, you go from essentially, you know, being in the driver's seat driving stick to now you are sort of in the way back of a limo. Yeah. What was that like emotionally? Hmm, it's hard. Was it gratifying still? Probably the least professionally gratifying period because you realize that like you don't have all the controls, which is a necessary reality. Like, cause even when you do have the controls, you don't have all the controls. I was being tasked to sort of put myself out there at once, but the level of depth of my touch was becoming increasingly lighter. 
right? So there was a dissonance there, right, as a creator. There was a dullness during that period. There were a couple years of a dullness. What exactly happened in that 2007 to 2008, nine period that the business jumped off the rails? Oh, there were so many things that happened. I think the most catalytic thing was the financial markets crashing. If you remember, that was when we, I was spinning Complex off and starting to bring in investors because Complex mm -hmm. at the time was wholly owned by just, you know, uh, me and, and Seth. You signed leases in 2005, 2006, and the 2007, 8 financial crisis where the banks are going upside down. So, you know, having confrontational meetings, just feeling the, you know, the weight of what personal guarantee means when you're effectively upside down, right? It's just it's basic math, right? You had, you had more inventory, both of people, of product and leases than you do market demand. Market demand is being affected by macro conditions. Most of them, I think, were macro, but some self-inflicted. There were philosophical differences that started to show up. Some of those things of sort of adult, sort of professional divorce, you know, people go through that, especially me and Seth. We came up as teenagers, effectively, into this thing. We were babies. So it was a very emotionally heavy business. And also feeling just, frankly, tired. Burnout's a real f thing. Well, you guys were 18 years into the business or so at that Non-stop. point. Nonstop. Tired from the travel, tired from the expectations, tired from, you know, explaining to the bankers why complex made sense and why getting up made sense. And, you know, I, I felt people trying to encroach on my creative ambition. And it was my creative ambition that got us to the place of success. As this dust started to settle on your core business, how did you and Seth extricate yourself and sort of settle affairs? It was a very slow and sloppy and messy with lots of yelling and crying and um, mean things said. And lawyers and uh, it was a mess. The mechanics of it were Seth would partner with a company called Iconics that was a publicly held company. They were buying me out of my position, trading my interest into a per perpetual royalty, and I would take Complex and we'd buy Seth out and we would land the plane like that. So I was betting on Complex. But you know, the brand went on still to this day. We're on our 30th anniversary. You know, I'm working on a little like capsule for it. I'm not ashamed of it. I travel the world, I still see it. I still love the brand. It's an important part of my history. No longer an active participant in the company that he named and founded, Mark would find redemption in the explosive growth of Complex, and especially the passion project he championed at the brand, ComplexCon. After subsequently helping Shepard a several hundred million dollar exit from Complex, Mark would turn his attention to philanthropy, joining forces with Steve Jobs' widow, Lorraine Powell Jobs, and working on her nonprofit initiatives, XQ and the Emerson Collective. You, in that divorce, end up taking Complex, yeah. which at the time was profitable, but doing fairly modest mm -hmm. revenue. And I, I would say, I think we both agree, largely on the strength of Rich's innovation around mm -hmm. the complex network yes. as, as a vertical ad network, we were able to scale the business out of the recession quite against all odds. Yeah. In those moments uh, of separation, when you were looking at complex, did you have any idea that it could be what it would eventually become? Yeah, I did. And I still, even even being away from the business in any sort of operational way, I still look at my babies and my businesses, my my um, the problems that these platforms are trying to solve as relevant and pertinent. And I understood the power of uh, the audience, and that there was an unmet need from a demographic point of view from a just overall content 
perspective. To the point of your belief in that audience, I think one of the most important and consequential things that you brought to the table at Complex, yeah. you know, was while we were building this digital audience that was real, but it was numbers on a screen, this inspired you to have the idea to birth ComplexCon. Yeah. And this was a controversial idea within the office. This was scrutinized. Yes. Um, it seemed very scary. Yeah, it was scary. People were scared for good reason, because not like I hadn't taken some swings and misses in my career. And I think that always sort of lingered for me, is that uh, as much as Mark is, uh, could hit it out of the park, he could also put a lot at risk in his sort of blind crusader-like pursuit of uh, an entrepreneurial endeavor. You know, it's scary when someone gets into that kind of, that, you know, that mode that they're seeing something. You know, but I also remember me and you sitting around brainstorming, thinking about getting all the right stakeholders on board. This is a much well-lived and learned lesson from the Echo days of not distributing the, the, <laughs> the, the, the risk and getting the right stakeholders. I was convinced to, to engage with Takashi because I had a good rapport with him over a year of back and forth. Let's do something, let's do something, let's do something. And then you were like, let's go visit Pharrell. That's and right. we went on the back lot of The Voice and we pitched ComplexCon. Market making scary. That's what I've been my whole career. Is like I help validate markets. I try to make marketplaces organized where they don't necessarily exist. I see the pattern, and I try to try to help organize the pattern. And and so you see that flock, and you just see, you see, like, oh, it's a flock. After we meet Pharrell, mm -hmm. he says he's into it. You and I are headed to dinner mm -hmm. to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And I look at you with your phone, and I ask you if you're day trading, because I can just sort of like peek over your... <laughs> and you're like, no, I'm buying crypto. And this is the spring of 2016. Right, right. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what's that? Right. Yeah. And you explain to me Web3, but I am curious, how did Web3 come onto your radar? What was your fascination then? And what do you think about Web3 as we move forward? It's during that financial crisis when I'm on the balls of my ass with a lot of public shame, right? Feeling really bad about myself, selling my namesake. My friend and partner at the, t at the time introduces me to this crazy article about a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. And it was all a reaction to the banking crisis. So I got turned on to Bitcoin and you know, cryptographically designed stores of value because of the predicament I was in, because I was getting so royally screwed by my banks. And that made me go down a rabbit hole, like a revenge fantasy of wanting to understand it. I'm just restless about systems redesign rather than sort of wring my hands and complain about the way things are. I believe there's a path to towards solving a lot of our biggest issues just by like making new solutions that are better. I believe that there's no such thing as a good idea or a bad idea because nothing's that definitive. I don't think ideas live on a spectrum so binary between good and bad. Almost at exactly the same time that we are flying to LA to meet with Pharrell to figure out ComplexCon mm -hmm. 1, Rich is concurrently negotiating the sale of Complex to Verizon and Hearst. Yeah. And I have to ask, the deal gets done. We all exit for 300 plus million dollars, reportedly, according mm -hmm. to the Wall Street Journal. And you've talked about the shame that you experienced at the end of Echo and mm -hmm. having to deal with that going bust in a certain sure. way. What was the sort of emotional payoff for you to then, six years later, put this tremendous W on the board? Oh, it felt, it felt great. I don't, I don't feel like Echo was, the Echo business, how it landed, the plane landed, was uh, something to feel shame for. 
the shame inducing feelings have m less to do about my ego as much as it was the disappointment with my friends and the people I loved and my colleagues and feeling like I could have done better by the people that worked so hard for me. I was gonna say on the flip side, I mean, with Complex, yeah. you did quite the opposite and... That, so yeah, that was gratifying. We could all win together and it was a better distribution of risk and a better distribution of upside. There is something really powerful in the incredible feat of, of, of getting humans to organize, to do something together and to do it against a plan. And it's like one of the most gratifying things. After Complex Sales, both of us stick around for about a year and a half yeah, yeah. until the fall of yeah. 2017 and end up going our separate ways. Yeah. I mean, I went to an adjacent space at Def Jam. You went in a completely different direction, going to work yeah. at an NGO, right. um, XQ, right. and the Emerson Collective, yes. Marine Powell Jobs' yeah. institution. What inspired you to go in that direction? And tell what do you what do you do for them? One of the many sort of domains of interest and pursuit for me has been philanthropy and specifically the educational space, the high school space. I have actually a history being the space amongst ed reformers. The, uh, the corporal punishment right. uh, initiative. That... I funded lawsuits against states that were allowing corporal punishment, physical restraint in schools and I had some success. So the Corporal Punishment Initiative is how I ended up getting to meet the woman who was the, the Under Secretary of Education in the Office of Civil Rights, Ruslan Ali. Ruslan went on to become the CEO of XQ. So I found myself in DC nerding out on this and like really leaning into it and became really friendly with Ruslan. And so I felt very lucky when she was launching XQ. She asked me to join the board at the XQ Institute, which is um, effectively a high school redesign initiative. We launched with 20 or so uh, schools that are all informed by a, a certain set of design principles. And we're really trying to make redesign open source and practical and available to districts and states and you know, in contrary to popular opinion, like if you, 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 you know, if you want to see something anew, you know, just because the system, you feel the weight of the system and you convince yourself that you can't, you actually can. And just believing that you can makes the difference. Being able to bring folks from outside of philanthropy to philanthropy has been one of the most professionally challenging and gratifying things I've ever done. And to realize I spent most of the my career about like myself, my own sense of authorship, my own, like me, 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 and like seeing the power of we. It's why I went to, to, to join Ruslan and, and very generously, like Lorene offered me to join. I was so eager because their, their vision was clear. And, you know, I'm proud to say that through the years that we've been there, um, we're now in partnership with the Carnegie Foundation themselves with them saying what we've been waving the flag on. So it's a very exciting time uh, professionally. It's maybe not as, um, there, you know, it's, it's, it's not as sort of a much public fanfare, but I think it's as meaningful as anything I've done. You've built two businesses that have reached ubiquity. You've raised children to adulthood. Yeah. You're now in the middle of your third act, giving back. Yeah. If you were to sit with a 21-year-old creative entrepreneur, what, and you had 45 seconds, as we do in this right. moment, to impart some wisdom on them, what would that be? Be curious. You know, don't let, you, you know, school get in the way of your education. You know, you have to be a lifelong learner. Know that you're not alone in every way, right? Uh, collaborating is powerful, right? Working with the team, distributing the decision-making power, being part of that orchestra, that, 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 that thinking orchestra of problem solving. Man, that's when the shit at its best. <laughs> <laughs>